Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hi and uh, welcome to this last lecture on this uh, text by Rabindranath Tagore called The Purest Master which we are covering uh, for the purpose of our course 20th century fiction. So today will be the last lecture for this particular text but of course you can all come back to it later and discuss it further more generally or even more specifically if you have any uh, further clarifications to make. So we stop at the last lecture we stop at the point where the protagonist the post martyr is, uh, is about to leave uh, Ratan who is this little girl who worked for her and with whom they you know he developed an empathic relationship. So the entire story is essentially about the creation of empathy. So we have two very uh, different individuals, one urban um, you know young man uh, presumably from Calcutta, presumably from an urban background uh, finds himself uh, you know empathetic or establishing an economy of empathy with a little girl from a very rural setting in, in Bengal, Ulapur, the name of the place, the name of the village where he's situated as postmaster. And we've seen how the colonial backdrop is very important, the indigo factory, the post office, these are all colonial sites, uh, spaces uh, of colonial machinery with which the entire administrative uh, operation uh, was established. Uh, so against this backdrop, against this very colonial architecture, we have uh, the story of two human beings um, you know, establishing an empathetic relationship with each other. But we see how, of course, in the last section we, we saw we stopped uh, at the point where the postmaster is about to leave this uh, village why he finds himself. Uh, so that is a very important uh, feature in this particular story, how two human beings are very different from each other, they establish this empathic relationship. And a postmaster over here at this point, he's on the verge of leaving uh, this village because you know he fell ill as we saw and he found himself unable to cope with this entire setting, this entire uh, situation any further. Uh, and then we have this entire, you know, the difference in communication. The moment he tells Ratan that he's about to leave the, the village for good and not coming back, uh, she goes back to being just a servant. She goes back to seeing just to being just an errant girl for the postmaster. And in fact, the entire communication changes, the order of communication changes, the vocabulary changes, the rhetoric changes. And that change in linguistic register is important to notice for us because that, I mean, language essentially is a reflection of the mind and how the mind th thinks, how the thought processes operate in the mind. Uh, is reflected in the language, because it's reflected rhetorically in the linguistic register. But over here we find that Ratan has gone back to being a servant, has gone back to being uh, the errand girl for the Pierce master. Now, so at this point uh, we, we get to know that, you know, postmaster uh, tries to redeem the entire situation and tells Ratan, and this should be on your screen, the master said, you need not be anxious about me going away, Ratan. I shall tell my successor to look after you. These words were kindly meant, no doubt, but unscrutable are the ways of a woman's heart. So again, we have this entire idea of a man's heart and a woman's heart, slightly binaristic in quality. But then if you look through that and you know, look beyond that binary, what is essentially being told away here is, uh, you know, the postmaster uh, in, in a very, uh, you know, gentlemanly way, he's trying to redeem the situation, he's trying to tell Ratan that you don't be so worried. Whoever's come to come in, uh, whoever's about to come in for my position later, I will tell a person to be kind to you, but I'll tell a person to take care of you, to look after you essentially, to hire you. So Ratan had borne many a scolding from the master without complaint, uh, but these kind words she could not bear. She burst out weeping and said, no, no, you need not tell anybody anything at all about me. I don't want to stay on here. So, you know, we see over here that Ratan had ceased to be in her mind. She had ceased to be the servant for the postmaster and she had ceased to be and she had become in a way family for the postmaster. So, we had, saw, we had seen uh, before how the, when the postmaster was ill, you know, she had become the mother figure for the postmaster, nurturing him back to health, healing him back to health. So she's become much more than just a servant girl over here and now she doesn't want to go back to being a servant once that now she's got this existential experience of being something else. So I don't want to stay on here. So she wants to go away from this place for good, like the postmaster. She doesn't want to continue as a servant girl in this situation anymore. The postmaster was dumbfounded. So we have a complete break in communication over here. So which is very ironical because we have seen how the postmaster have been teaching Ratan uh, letters 
uh, of the Bengali alphabet, uh, you know, the script, and she had made great progress. But now uh, she is saying certain things which the postmaster doesn't understand. So she had obviously mastered. Uh, she's emotionally more rich away. Uh, she's emotionally more complex away. Uh, and the postmaster is unable to gauge the complexity of the situation, the complexity of the communication, so to say. So she, he was dumbfounded. He had never seen Ratan like this before. The new incumbent duly arrived, and the postmaster, having given over charge, prepared to depart. So a new person is about to join in, a step in for the postmaster, the incumbent. He arrives, the new government officer, the new postmaster essentially, uh, and then the postmaster, our postmaster of the story, gives him the charge, tells him the duties, explains the situation to him, and is preparing to leave. Just before starting, he called Ratan and said, Here is something for you. I hope it will keep you for some little time. So some kind of a parting gift. He brought out from his pocket the whole of his month's salary, retaining only a trifle for his travelling expenses. So this is something that he wants to give generously. Uh, so he wants to give his, his entire salary to Rutten, just keeping a little bit for himself, uh, a little trifle for his um, uh, travelling expenses. The rest of the money he wants to give to Rutten. Uh, so his entire salary, which is presumably a substantial amount of money, especially from Rutten's perspective, uh, is being given to Rutten by the Pierce Master. Uh, as some kind of a parting gear, but also we are told away, uh, we, we get to know away, uh, the postmaster is trying to do this to make himself feel better about the whole situation. And Rutten, of course, presumably and understandably, uh, refused to take the gift, refused to accept the gift as it were. Then Rutten fell at his feet and cried, Oh Dada, I pray you, don't give me anything, don't in any way trouble about me. And then she ran away out of sight. So she refused to take the gift. And this refusal to accept the gift is very important away here because she wants to retain uh, the empathetic bond, the existential and emotional bond that she establishes with the postmaster. She doesn't want to go back. Uh, to being the servant girl. I mean, she does the duties of a servant girl before the postmaster leaves, but in her mind, she's already left the place. In her mind, she's, you know, ceased to be part of the place anymore. And by refusing to accept the gift from the postmaster, uh, she refused to be the servant. She refused to be, you know, she accept the fact that he was a master and she was a servant over here. And she retains the privilege of the, of the emotional relationship, the privilege of the companionship that they had, that they had established over this period of time. So this refusal is a very symbolic refusal on her part. The refusal is a rejection to be treated as a, as a servant over here and is a retention to a certain extent of the empathic relationship that she had with the postmaster. Okay, so that, that's an important symbolic gesture on Rutten's part. The refusal is important over here. So it's a retention, it's an act of rejection of the servant master relationship and so retention of the brother sister relationship, which is essentially priceless, which cannot be quantified by any amount of money. Okay, the postmaster heaved a sigh, took up his carpet bag, put his umbrella over his shoulder, and accompanied by a man carrying his many colored tin trunk, he slowly made for the boat. So, this is Rudal Bengal and this is Colonial Bengal, it's the only way of communication to and from Calcutta when boats. Right? So, it's a very common uh, iconic image of people from villages coming to Calcutta in boats. So, obviously, there were no roadways, no bridges at that time, the way we know it today. So, boats were the only means of uh, travel at that point in time. So, this very symbolic image of the postmaster walking with his umbrella uh, and a man carrying his tin trunk ahead of him and the two of them making their way to the boat, which would take him back to Calcutta. It's this very iconic pre-colonial image and colonial image of rural Bengal, uh, you know, so to say. When he got in and the boat was underway, uh, and a, a rain swollen river, like a stream of tears welling up from the earth, swirled and sobbed at her brow at her bows, that he felt a pain at heart. The grief stricken face of a village girl seemed to represent for him the great unspoken, pervading grief of Mother Earth herself. So we see over here a very interesting uh, reflection in nature of what's happening with the human mind. So the human mind, the human emotions over here. Are reflected by the landscape around. So the uh, the river looks rain swollen, and and of course the entire rain swollen thing becomes a metaphor for a teary river. It's like streams of tears f uh, flowing from the uh, welling up from the mother earth. So we can see the rivers humanized away, uh, the earth is humanized away, uh, and the rains of the river, the rain swollen river, uh, is humanized to extend. It looks like the uh, a very teary eyes of a mother earth. So it's feminized and humanized to a great extent. So it's swirling and sobbing at her bows. Then he felt a pain at heart. So you know this entire projection of human emotions at, at play over here. So the grief-stricken face of the village girl. So she, he keeps remembering uh, the grief in, in Ratan's face, and you know that kind of a, you know it's almost like a mourning uh, image. She's mourning the departure of someone beloved. Uh, it's almost like a death of a certain relationship, the death of a certain human relationship. So in that sense, it's the death of a certain human emotion uh, to that extent. 
And that seems to represent for him the great unspoken, both having grief of Mother Earth herself. So the unspoken grief, so the entire uh, unuttered grief. So, and that's also a very important thing, the fact that Rotten doesn't spell out why she's so sad, uh, but everything is communicated so perfectly. And that not spelling out and yet communicating becomes a very important mechanism over here. Uh, it's almost an existential mechanism which the postmaster is you know, absorbing at the moment. So Ratha never spelled out why she's so unhappy, why she's so sad at the postmaster's departure. But we all know, having read the story, that they had established a very empathetic relationship, a companionship, so to say. And she had refused to go back to being the servant for the postmaster. She had done all the chores for the postmaster on the last day. She had filled the bucket with water. Uh, she had cleaned the house. She had done all the chores of, of a servant. But at that moment of time, she refused to be the servant. I mean, she had retained uh, to a great extent the, the privilege of being the companion. And, the, and like I said a little while before, her refusal to accept the money as a parting gift from the postmaster, as a refusal, a rejection of the master-servant relationship and the retention of the privileged companionship that she had established with the postmaster. And now we see over here, the postmaster is projecting his uh, thought processes onto the nature around her, the natural landscape around him. And it seems to him, it appears to him that, you know, the Mother Earth is sobbing uh, and the entire, uh, the, the face of Ratham becomes a, a metonymic reflection, uh, partly a reflection of the entire Mother Earth uh, nature and you know, not being able to communicate his grief. But at the same time, the human nature relationship becomes a very entangled relationship over here. And it's also very symbolic because he's going back to Calcutta, uh, which is essentially uh, symbolically uh, a metropolitan place, uh, so away from nature. So it's a departure from nature, geographically as well as existentially, is beautifully depicted over here. So he's going away from nature, he's going away from Ratham. So Ratham becomes, in a way, uh, the image of Mother Earth in rural Bengal. Okay, so that the, the interruption of that bond is interesting. Away here is uh, it, it generates existential suffering in the postmaster's heart. The fact that he's going back to Calcutta, which is a city, which is presumably less natural, presumably less organic, uh, less spontaneous, and less uh, you know emotional than a rural setting that he is departing from. So Ratan becomes over here. Uh, you know, he, she becomes the personification of rural Bengal. So the entire story can now be read as an allegory now of the young man from the city coming to stay in rural Bengal and establishing a companionship with rural Bengal uh, and then de deciding to depart after a certain point because of ill health. And the sorrow uh, in Rotten's heart, the sorrow in Rotten's face is reflected and projected and by different natural signifiers such as rain, the river uh, and the trees, everything around uh, the postmaster now seems to communicate to him what Rutten did not communicate clearly. Well, yeah, it's, it's com been communicated to him through symbolic gestures, through natural landscapes which becomes uh, an overload of cognitive communication. Right? So we're moving away from an order of verbal communication to a more cognitive communication. Uh, where we have natural landscapes coming up together to communicate a sorrow of uh, rural Bengal, uh, the departure of the urban sun, so to say. So, you know, this allegory becomes uh, quite established at this point in the story. Okay, so at one time, he had an impulse to go back and bring away along with him that lonesome wife, forsaking of the world. So at some point, he actually thought that maybe I should go back and take her back with me, uh, bring her back with me, which is something she suggested at some point. Uh, she had suggested, why don't you take me with you uh, and then I can stay with you in Calcutta, I can be one of a family person. So we've seen, we had seen how at some point before in the story that she had uh, begun to imagine herself uh, as someone inserted in the family structure, in the kin structure of, of the first master. And because she's consumed all the stories, she's consumed all the narratives from the postmaster about his family, about his uh, mother, about his sister. And now she's begun, she had begun to believe herself to be one of them and to a certain extent. Uh, so, and another postmaster is thinking, reflecting on his mind, uh, deliberating whether or not he should go back and bring back the lonesome wife, the orphan girl, uh, so to say, and, and rescue her essentially uh, by taking her with him to Calcutta. But the wind had just filled the sails. The boat had got when in the middle of the turbulent current and already the village was left behind and its outlying burning ground came in sight. So again, the natural signifiers become very symbolically uh, present over here. The wind had pushed the sails, so it was already underway and the boat had got well in the middle of the turbulent current. So it's become turbulent because monsoon is rainy and the village was left behind uh, and this outlying uh, burning ground came inside. So that is a very symbolic space, the burning ground, the, the, the cremation ground, uh, in a place where the funeral pyres are set. 
So that's why the dead bodies are brought in. So you know the postmaster can just see that, and that is essentially on the fringes of the village. So every village had a fringe space where the you know dead bodies, the the, the people who died, uh, would be brought in for for you know. Uh, the funeral pie and that, that becomes like a, a crematory, uh, not a crematory, but uh, no, a funeral space uh, for the post for the for the village folk. And the postmaster can now see that, just that, and that becomes a very fringe space for the village. And he can just see that and it's moving away from the village, so he doesn't see the nurturing village anymore. He sees a dead village, uh, and that becomes a dead space in that sense, and that dead nest of the space, that space where the uh, in the burning ground where funeral pyres are set up. So that becomes uh, an image of deadness uh, in this particular point in the story. Uh, deadness, a human uh, relationship, the postmaster is moving away from something which is now essentially dead. He can't recover it, he can't resurrect it anymore. Okay, and again, so we see how to go is such a master in terms of using natural signifiers, natural spaces or spatial signifiers in order to communicate in more human emotions and, and com communicate uh, the human states of mind. So the departure uh, from the nurturing village and the side of the dead village uh, becomes quite uh, symbolically present, spectacularly present at this point in the story. Okay, so the burning ground becomes a very symbolic space at this point. So the traveller, born on the breast of the swift flowing river, consoled himself with philosophical reflections on the numberless meetings and partings going on in the world. On death, the great parting from which none returned. So again, look at the way in which the human mind is informed by the natural space or natural landscape. So he sees a dead space, he sees a, a burning uh, space, uh, the space where many human bodies are burnt in a funeral pious. And that triggers in him, that generates in his mind uh, a philosophical deliberation about you know, departure and death being the greatest departure. This is what I just said about how the depart departure, the entire act of departure, the entire gesture of departure, the entire activity of departure, a process of departure is uh, magnified into a symbolic image of death. Uh, and that image of deadness and the space of deadness, the speciality of death becomes very, very important over here as a sort of a really intense signifier of departure, the departure, the ultimate departure, the eventual departure, right? So the, the postmaster, a traveler, and interestingly, we are told is a traveler now, someone who is sort of traveling all the time, uh, you know, and is flowing on this uh, river, the turbulent river, he is consoling himself now with the entire reflections of numberless meetings and partings going on. In other words, the liminality of life, liminality being the threshold condition, people just come and go. So the liminal condition is a threshold condition between two states of mind, between two states of being. So the postmaster is deliberating over here of the liminality of life, of living itself. Life is a liminal process of uh, endless meetings and, and, and partings going on. And then of course he thinks of death, the great parting, the great departure, the ultimate departure from which none returns. And also look at the way if you visualize it, it's quite cinematic actually, if you visualize it, we have this lonely man travelling away from a village in this boat which is uh, sails have been filled with the wind and is travelling into or across the river and you can see this panoramic image of the, of the burning space, the space where you know, the bodies were burnt uh, as by Hindu rituals, the funeral cart so to say, the funeral pyre uh, space and is consoling himself by dwelling and uh, deliberating on the philosophical uh, idea of life as a series of departures. And then looking at the space where the dead bodies are brought in, uh, he begins to think about the, the great departure, the ultimate departure of death from which none returns. But then look at the immediate contrast between th that kind of a philosophical uh, uh, musing and Ratan's mind. And we are told now, but Ratan had no philosophy. She was wondering about the post office in a flood of tears. It may be that she still had a lurking hope that in some corner of her heart that the other would return and that, she's, uh, and that is why she could not tear herself away. Uh, alas for a foolish human nature. So again, look at the complete contrast between the two thought processes. So while the postmaster is consoling himself by thinking of deep, lofty, uh, indulgent uh, philosophical musings about you know, departures and liminality and death, Ratan on the other hand is just crying around in the lonely post office in the full second post office now, which is now emptied of purpose. Uh, and then uh, you know, she had some, some hope, uh, hoping against hope as it were, uh, that another, her brother would return you know, and you know, take her away, maybe continue to work away and she would get to see him again. And that is why she could not tear herself away, so she could not really go away from the place yet. 
So she's still nurturing some hope in her mind that her daughter would return, her brother would return, the postmaster would return, and she would establish and re-establish and revive the companionship that she had with him at some point in time. Alas, for a foolish human nature, its fond mistakes are persistent. The dictates of reason take a long time to assert their own sway. So, you know, we have again a sort of binary over here between manly reason, urban reason, and uh, rural feminine um, emotions. So, we, the entire idea of feminine and rural are uh, sort of connected to emotional and sentiments, whereas the urban and male are connected to reason. So, again, we have a sort of a binaristic trope over here, which is slightly problematic, but that's how the story stands. So, we'll read it accordingly. So, the dictates of reason take a long time to assert their own sway. The Shiva's proofs, meanwhile, are disbelief. False hope is clung to with all one's might and, and main till a day comes when it has sucked the heart dry and it forcibly breaks through its bonds and departs. After that comes the misery of awakening and then once again the longing to get back into the maze of the same mistakes. So we, we see how uh, Ratan is describing very, very emotional terms and the narrator, the omniscient narrator, the third person narrator in the story tells us that a human heart knows the reason and Ratan obviously is all heart away here. She's inhabiting uh, the entire emotional landscape at the moment uh, and then uh, this is a situation, this is a condition where people keep making mistakes uh, and false hopes are uh, an embrace, false hopes are clung on to with all one's might and main until a day comes when it is sucked the heart dry and forcibly breaks through its bonds and departs. So it, it comes to the point where it just takes away all the sustenance from the heart, the false hopes and then it departs. Uh, it leaves you uh, completely evacuated of all emotion, uh, completely evacuated and liquidated as it were, uh, shut down emotionally and existentially. After that comes the misery of awakening. So that awakening is a rude awakening, it is a rational rude awakening where you realize that you have been clinging on to false hopes all the time and now it's time to wake up, now it's time to uh, embrace reality as it were. And then once again, the longing to get back into the maze of the same mistakes, right? So the same mistakes of emotion, the same mistakes of you know sentiments, the same sentimental mistakes, the same you know, romantic mistakes, the same emotional mistakes are being made away. Uh, uh, this is a general commentary on human nature, how human nature, we are hardwired to be emotional, we are hardwired to be hopeful. And this hopefulness is a state of human nature, the sort of human mind. And then sometimes we hope against hope, uh, we cling on to false hopes until everything departs, every, every little glimmer of hope de departs forever. And then we get a rude awakening, we wake up to reality, a very rude reality. And then you know, all we can do uh, is you know, liquidate ourselves existentially and then go back and perhaps look for the same mistakes over and over again. So in that sense, um, in the emotional idea of the emotional situation, the human condition uh, is glorified, romanticized to a certain extent over here. Whereas the reasonable human emotion, uh, you know, someone who takes a reasonable decision, departs uh, from uh, a place of ill health and goes away to urban setting, and that is looked down upon to that extent. So we can clearly see where Tagore's uh, affiliations lie, where Tagore's biases lie as a writer. Uh, she, he is definitely more biased, is definitely more affiliated to the entire idea of emotional human nature, sentimental human nature, uh, which uh, is the truest way, according to Tagore, according to the narrator way at least, the truest way to be a human being. So the entire story is about uh, human condition, the entire story is about the complexity of human condition, the emotional complexity, which cannot always be communicated. But it is also interesting to see how the emotional complexity colludes uh, to a certain extent in terms of the communicative realm with natural signifiers, how nature colludes with the human heart over here and communicates what cannot be communicated verbally. So the sight, the image of the, by the postmaster, a very panoramic cinematic image of the postmaster sailing away from the rural uh, village, away back to the Calcutta, back to the metropolitan side of Calcutta uh, and looking at the entire departure by just, you know, getting a sight. The only visible thing about the village is the funeral site, the funeral fringe of the village where you know, dead bodies are brought in for cremation, uh, you know, they're burned over there, the holy uh, side, but that's also a side which triggers in him, uh, which generates in him the feeling of departure and then he thinks about departure, some liminality and then the only great departure, there's a death that comes to his mind and he sort of philosophizes about it as well. And then it cut into, uh, we take, that was a long shot and then it cut into a close up of Rotten, who was still loitering around, uh, you know, hovering around, uh, lurking around uh, the empty post office, hoping against hope uh, that his other, her other, her companion will come back at some point and they will 
go back to being companions again. And the story ends with a commentary on the complexity of human uh, emotions, where you know, human emotions compel you to a certain extent to hope against hope. Uh, and in that hope against hope, you forgo reason, you forsake reason, uh, and then you cling on to all kinds of false hopes. You, you cling on to the last remnants of uh, false hopes until everything is liquidated. And then you wake up to a very rude reality. Uh, it's like a jolt, essentially. Uh, and then you go back again, looking for that hope, go back again, looking for the emotion. So in a way, we are hardwired to be emotional, like you said, and that's what the go commands on at this point in the story. So the entire story, in a nutshell, is a very human emotional story, and again, it's a very colonial backdrop, and this is one of the uh, mastery of Tagore's writing that the political is always there, uh, the political setting, the cultural setting, the, the social setting is always there, uh, but it's never really foregrounded. What gets foregrounded is a human setting, the human emotion, the emotional setting as it were. Uh, but that doesn't mean the story is less political, it's a profoundly political story because if we take a look at the uh, politics, uh, the, the, the magnificent difference between rural Bengal and urban Calcutta is just so dramatic. Uh, they're like two different species altogether. Uh, they don't understand each other after a point. Uh, the postmaster doesn't know why Ratan is upset. The Ratan doesn't know why the postmaster is going. So the entire difference in communication, the entire difference in states of mind is obviously reflective of the difference in cultural settings between rural Bengal and urban Bengal. The massive difference, uh, the massive departure as it were, the discrepancy between the way urban Bengal operates and the way rural Bengal operates at this point in the story, at this point in the history. So it is a profoundly political story because we also see a series of uh, very colonial senior fires, the post office being the supreme example of that, and also the Indigo factory. And the inability of the postmaster to have any communication with Indigo factory workers is interesting because that goes to show how the factory workers are alienated, they completely become machines producing or catering to the, the entire politics of production of colonialism because the entire Indigo which is uh, produced and, and manufactured from the factory will be presumably shipped back. Uh, to England and different parts of different mercantile corners. So, you know, all that politics is always there and the political machinery is very much present in the story. So, I think, I mean, sometimes Tagore is unfairly accused of being a non-political writer, is uh, a profoundly political writer and his literature is full of political presence, full of political performances. But what gets foregrounded, which makes him such a great writer, is that the human emotion, the human story is the, what takes us center stage. And the political backdrop is there the, the, as a backdrop, like I just mentioned. So it's a very dialogic kind of a uh, narrative style where the uh, political visibility is always there, you know, the architecture is there, the signifiers are all there. But what gets foregrounded, what gets celebrated and start to romanticize to a certain extent in the stories of the human emotions, the human communications and the human lives which are dram dramatized uh, in his, his narratives uh, throughout his over of work. So with that we come to conclusion of the story. I hope you enjoyed reading it I and mean, do go back and read it in its entirety and, and if you have any questions, any clarifications to make, feel free to write about it in the forum that we have and we can all always come back to this and have a more generic discussion on it in comparison and contrast to some of the other texts that we'll do in this course. So with that we come to the conclusion of the Postmaster and we move on to the next text in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.